Good morning, and thank you for joining us. My name is Katie Austing. I'm a marketing manager here at Superior Support Resources, and I'll be your host and moderator for this morning's Tech Bytes session, IT Strategy Now versus Pre-Pandemic. I just have a few housekeeping items before we get started and some intros. First, if at any time during the session you see at the start broadcast screen, please press play. You will return to the live session. If you have any tech technical issues during the session, please use the reconnect function at the top of your window. Restart your browser window or reach out to the admin group in the chat function if possible. Um, we'll get you reconnected. Also chat with us throughout the session. We'll address questions either as they come up or at the end in the Q&A session. Um, you can toggle between asking the questions or chatting with admin only or everybody in the session. Also um, at the lower right of your screen is where you'll see polling questions pop up during today's session. We hope you enjoy participating and, and appreciate getting insights from others in attendance. We'll share the results and, and this session will be recorded. The slide deck and the recording will be shared with you no later than three day, business days after the session. For those of you who are not familiar with SSR, Superior Support Resources, we have been providing small to mid-sized businesses with technology services that increase productivity, improve profitability, and reduce risk for more than 20 years. Our total IT service capabilities that you see on the right allow us to be far more than managed service provider and provide a well-rounded, tailored solution that scales up or back with your technology needs. From keeping you up and running to securing your environment, developing specialized reporting and applications. As you can see, we work with our clients on their technology strategy at many levels, making today's topic near and dear to our team. So with that, let's dive into IT strategy now versus pre-pandemic. As the session description indicated, our discussion today will cover four primary points um, listed on the screen, forces impacting businesses and IT strategy today assessing your current technology environment and strategy, aligning that strategy with your business and strategy and goals, and creating and maintaining a flexible and agile technology strategy. Lots of strategy going on today. Um, our speakers today, we have three. Um, Sarat Singhal, SSR's president and CEO. He has more than 25 years of information systems experience and focuses on digital strategy and transformation at the CIO level. He likes to sail. He lives in, a, in Brookfield with his wife and two kids, but one just left for college. So now I guess it's just one kid. Um, Sarah, do you wanna add a little more about yourself? Yeah, thank you everyone. And, and thank you, Katie, for the introduction. Um, my background, again, I, I've done everything from being an engineer to doing project management, to helping clients uh, come up with uh, IT governance uh, and solutions to their, to their business needs. Awesome, thank you. Um, our next panelist is Nick Gartman, our field engineering manager. He has more than 12 years of IT infrastructure, environment, and strategy experience, and he works closely with our clients to implement best practices and tailored solutions. He lives in Waukesha with his wife and three kids. And Nick, do, would you please tell us a little more about yourself? Hi, yeah, I'm actually an uh, electrical engineering major, um, went directly into IT after college. Um, it's what gets me up in the morning. Uh, it's what I love doing. Um, so as of 12 years ago, it's what I do and uh, work closely with the rest of my field engineers and um, make us making us moving forward. Thanks for uh, joining the meeting. Awesome. Thank you. And last but not least, Jeff Matt is he is one of our account executives. He's been um, in technology account management for more than 20 years. And he works with, closely with our clients on overall strategy, solutions, and projects for clients. He lives in Sussex with his wife and two kids. And Jeff, why don't you tell us a little more about yourself? Thanks, Katie. Happy to be here. Uh, yeah, I've been uh, I've been in the industry for 20 plus years. I've actually been with SSR for um, nine years as of last month. Um, really enjoy working with uh, small to medium sized companies, kind of understanding what their business goals are and, and aligning technology to just kind of meet what the, the requirements are. So happy to be part of the discussion and thanks for joining us. Awesome, thanks Jeff. Um, now we're gonna move into kind of our panel discussion. I'll ask our presenters to turn on their webcams and I'll um, get the slides off of there. Do a little transition here. All right, good morning. 
Good morning. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, let's just jump right in. And we know um, the pandemic has really created this avalanche of forces. Um, they're just impacting every aspect of businesses. And um, to kind of get in the most obvious one out there, remote work. Um, what are the trickle down effects you're seeing and forces that remote of remote forced remote work and how do organizations need to adjust? So um, why don't we start with you, sorry. Yeah, Katie, thank you. Um, you know, I'm going to kind of uh, answer it from a broad standpoint, not just from an SR standpoint, but sitting down with many, many clients over the last, uh, it seems like forever, but five months. Um, really some of the big things that small to mid-sized companies are struggling with is how do you maintain uh, culture and, and general etiquette? So what I mean by that is, um, you know, I, I've seen a number, a number of my clients struggle with uh, if they're even thinking about hiring people, how do I hire someone? How do I train them? And, and if I bring them in, how do I actually help them understand the culture of our organization? Um, one of the really key, key components of being in a, a, a small to mid companies is the culture and the and the interaction that we have with each other, when everyone's working remotely, it, it's harder to do that because uh, you you transact very well um, on on tools that uh, that you can sit down and say, hey, here's what we need to get done. But for you to kind of have that uh, bubbler conversation or have lunch with someone to get to know them, it it became harder. Um, I think work structure was another major item. Uh, when I think of it, that uh, that really the that companies need to adjust to. Uh, I think the example I'll give is 15 years ago, we all started getting these things called smartphones in our back pocket, and it seemed like work went from eight to five to being 24/7. Um, I'm starting to see some of that same exact thing, where in the past, and and many of you guys that are probably here, you you probably have your cell phone next to your your nightstand in bed. I know many of us are, are reading emails, uh, maybe you have a sleepless night, you're looking at it, reading it, um, same kind of concept on it. Now we're, we're connected with these remote devices. Um, I, I'm oftentimes in conference calls at eight, eight or nine o'clock at night, because that's the only time everyone's got, they can actually interact on it. Um, so I think we've got to look at you know our culture, we've got to figure out what that work structure, what the work day looks like, um, and then uh, really how do we measure productivity? Um, that one's a little bit tougher for many, many uh, organizations. Uh, there are certain roles that you can look at it. It's it's almost piecemeal like work. You can look at it and say, I, in, in our case, we have we have help desk and network operations. There, it's very easy for me to see and say how many calls that they take, what's their what's their performance metrics, things like that. But there's other roles which is harder for us to be able to determine productivity. Um, and and it seems to be kind of across the board where how are you allocating work and putting things together? Um, so we're working through that. We put together uh, daily report-ins, measuring uh, on, on, on productivity and things like that. That's a really good 3,000 foot view of kind of how businesses are being impacted. Um, Jeff, are you, what are you seeing? What are you hearing from clients? Um, yeah, I, you know, it, it's interesting. I think um, a lot of what, uh, what I've heard from clients is, you know, having some kind of ability to flex to, 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 to what's changing in the environment. Um, I think, you know, as an organization, we've kind of taken it for granted in terms of how easy it is as a technology company to shift from, you know, work in the office to, to on site because we have a lot of pieces in place that make it very seamless for us, for our help desk agents and for us from a sales perspective to be able to access applications and make all that work but you know the challenges i've seen for for a lot of my clients is just you know how they how they transition to that um you know and having to kind of scramble uh, to make that work because we all had that very short window to make that happen and and what they kind of learned along the way is that there have been um some exposures in their environment as it relates to technology that, that has been very challenging i had a particular client that had Kind of a legacy phone system. It was a voice over IP phone system, but um, it was it it worked fine for for how they were using it in office. But when they had to shift and pivot to to remote work, uh, there were some very basic administrative things within the system that they were not able to do. And because the phone system was out of support, um, they were more or less kind of forced with having to come up with a complete workaround. And within the last 30 days or so, they ended up moving to a hosted solution. 
So, I, you know, unfortunately, what ends up happening with 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 the pandemic is that it exposes a lot of weaknesses in client environments that that just force them to have to make quick decisions to to address. Um, the other thing is, Sara touched on this a little bit, but uh, you know, metrics for productivity. I mean, that's another thing that that has been a challenge for for clients that I've worked with in that there's not really a good way unless you've had systems in place that actually kind of track productivity. Um, you know, when people had shifted to remote work, um, I think that, you know, that that certainly has been a challenge. I mean, there's there's not a lot of good insight. I mean, if you look at just kind of the traditional things that you can see from an infrastructure standpoint, um, you know, those types of log files and things that you can actually get just from the system itself are not, you know, the kind of metrics that are going to give you good data on what, you know, productivity levels are from different people within different departments. So, you know, having a plan in place for that, if ultimately you know, this becomes more of a permanent type of situation and needing to understand that is going to be key to be putting in place. So that's an interesting point. Um, so, Nick, I know you were you're, you and your team were instrumental in getting a lot of clients up and running um, in a remote environment and, you know, thinking through um, some of the shifts that Jeff's talking about. Um, maybe you could comment on not only what um, that shift looked like, but what are what are your clients talking about going forward now in terms of remote work? So what we see is, okay, you have, uh, during this pandemic, you have forced remote work. People have seen and have witnessed that it's possible. You can do it. Uh, people in high school uh, are figuring out how to do uh, their school remotely. People in college are figuring out how to do everything remotely. Um, it is going to be with, you know, the, the, the trend as far as the new workforce and the next generation of workforce coming in to expect to see their jobs having a remote work option. Uh, just because we've all seen it work, we've all seen it make sense, technology is being tailored to it. So in order to be competitive, uh, for us to get, you know, the people that we want, uh, a lot of that is going to have to do with, do you have a remote work option? And some people even work better in a remote work environment. Um, so that's, it's, so instead of having the traditional sense of, I need to go into the office and I need to do my eight to five, um, people are going to expect the option to not have to go into the office and do that. So with that comes a lot of shift of uh, focus. Uh, you got issues with connecting from home. You got issues with help desk. How do you support somebody that you can't quickly go and touch their computer? Um, you got issues with security. How can you make sure that the people are connecting remotely securely? Um, so it's a, it's a lot of trend shifts and it's a lot of uh, focus shifts as far as trying to um, adjust to that situation. Yeah, I can see how that would impact strategy for sure. Um, Jeff, I, I, I want to hop back. Oh, sorry, did you want to jump in there? Yeah, I just want to add one other thing that um, I've recently heard the last two, three weeks. I've had two different situations <clears throat> where clients reached out to me. I think, uh, Jeff, you touched on this, where they were really interested in knowing what their employees were doing when they were home. Um, again, uh, there's a lot of tools out there. You can use tools to record um, whatever, what, what time an employee logs in, every little thing that they did on their screen. Um, but one of the things that I caution everyone about is, is culture again. Um, you know, there, there's there's a lot of tools that technology brings, but if you wouldn't have done that, if they were sitting in the office, you really, really want to think about it before you implement it. Because um, you can uh, very quickly change the culture of your company when those become policies. Um, the thing I would tell you is, you know, if you're having challenges with an employee, um, I, I was on a phone call with a, a client last week who heard rumors that one of their employees that was working from home was probably not working at home because somebody else saw a social media post that they were actually at a, at a beach. Um, well, uh, we were able to log into the system, see that the person actually logged in in the morning, was active throughout the entire day. But um, from their standpoint, it was uh, it was something in social media that they read. Um, it, it's just something I want to caution people on. Um, make sure you figure out those performance metrics and don't make assumptions on it very quickly. And if you're going to start doing active monitoring and things like that, think about the culture of the communication 
Um, in our help desk, we've always been actively monitoring because we use it from a quality standpoint and training standpoint. Um, there's a purpose behind it. But if you wouldn't have done it to that person or that role in the office, really, really think about it before you implement it. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and kind of sticking on that, I think you, you're you starting to hit on a topic that we, we talk about a lot, and that's key performance indicators and, and just kind of how do you measure performance. Are there, um, I think, let's stick with you for a second, sorry. Um, you know, how do you use those to actually enhance either, either collaboration, even innovation, and your culture at your company? What tools um, would you put in place? Uh, so first, Katie, you've asked me about seven questions in that one question. <laughs> but, I had about uh, three more I could have added in there, but I stopped. <laughs> um, so uh, I've been a big believer in KPIs from literally the day I, I started in the organization. Um, so KPIs really have to help you figure out. I, I've always believed KPIs are really a behavior modification tool. It helps you figure out where you're at, and it should be able to tell your team members what's working and what's not working. Where, where do we need to spend our energies? Um, and so I break down businesses into three basic legs, right? There's sales and marketing, there's operations and delivery, and then there's financials. Um, if you start measuring those three areas, how are we doing from getting new clients, getting quotes out the doors? Um, you can start looking at saying, what are those organizational KPIs? And then within our organization, how are our people driving those KPIs? Um, so if you look at from an operational standpoint, we're looking at it and saying, well, this is the number of transactions we normally have in a month. Um, are we still seeing the same number for, for clients um, uh, when it comes down to uh, uh, the, the number of preventive maintenance, the number of uh, different things we do for them? Well, that translates to here's our engineering team. How, how, um, how effective are they in getting this done? Um, it has created some unique uh, elements. One thing I will tell you is... Uh, um, even though we had KPIs, I know you're gonna, we'll probably end up talking about other impacts of this thing. It really uh, makes you kind of look at your processes. Um, uh, even as we kind of transition, and you think as a technology firm, we would have been ahead of this, even as we kind of transition to 80 to 90% of our workforce working from home, um, we really saw that some of our processes were really designed for a desk type collaboration, right? So I have a problem, I woke up, walk over to somebody else's desk, and they help me from that transaction side um, to get things done. This is where, again, the KPIs that we're looking at, how do, you, how do you measure performance, how do you help people from that standpoint, became really important. Um, our teams, from a culture standpoint, really have started putting together a, a weekly collaboration session where they talk through uh, what are things that are working, what are not working, and continue to get to know each other. Those have really, really become important. Um, and they, again, drive towards um, not only culture, but our performance that we're creating. Um, there are people I would tell you, I mean, I think uh, Nick kind of referred to this. There are people that uh, uh, actually work better at home. Uh, I've seen both sides. So I've seen uh, individuals actually that their performance is 20, 30 percent um, higher when, when it's measurable when they're working remotely. I've also seen the opposite of someone that was working in the office and their performance has dropped. And it wasn't because they're not trying. What we learned is these individuals uh, generally want somebody else that they can validate from, ask questions from before they can get their work done. Um, so we started using things like Teams to say, we literally created group chat sessions where everyone can actually, as they're going about their day, they can interact with each other uh, and ask those same type of questions. I think those are some of the things that are helping um, we do weekly standups across uh, each of our departments where we're looking at each individual performance, how things are going and what's working and what's not. So did that answer some of your questions? It did. It did. And actually, I, I kind of came into those collaboration tools because I think that, um, you know, is the answer a lot of people kind of landed on. But Nick, that does take some infrastructure. And, and maybe, Jeff, you can comment on this, too. Um, and I know we 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 have tools that we can recommend and we have infrastructure that we can put in place, but there were also some challenges tackled during that time. What, what are we seeing now, um, you know, I, b between shortages and hardware yeah. or implementation? Yeah, that, that's an interesting point. Um, you know, it was one of those things when everyone was kind of making the mad rush to getting everybody remote. Um, there was a huge constraint in the channel to get, you know, pretty much any kind of equipment, certainly laptops, um, we're very highly constrained in the channel. Um, 
But what's interesting is that over time, I mean, we've, we've got, you know, a good five months into this. Um, quite honestly, it hasn't changed that much in terms of, of those shortages because a lot of this equipment is actually coming out of China. So we're seeing shortages continue um, for those types of products, as well as we're even seeing it now on the infrastructure side where um, we've had clients that are looking to do some projects in terms of enhancements where, um, you know, we're waiting for extended period of time to, to get equipment in. So, you know, that's that's continuing to some degree. Um, the other thing with that, though, is that I think what I'm seeing with some of my clients is that a lot of times they've made, um, you know, Band-Aid type fixes to, to actually allow for their people to work remotely. So they might be working with an old piece of equipment. And I think that's one area that, you know, as we, as we look forward and understand that this might continue for a longer period of time, that, you know, you have to have that, that, that checkpoint back to say, you know, we, when we put this in place, we thought this was going to be a temporary fix, um, you know, or a Band-Aid, if you will. And now this is becoming more of a permanent type of solution. So is it from an efficiency standpoint, from a productivity standpoint, what we put in place for that person for their home office setup is that ideal? I mean, we've heard stories lately about, you know, simple things like, you know, your office chair at home or whatever you're sitting on at home, you know, it's nine times out of 10, it's not as, uh, as ergonomic as, as the chair you would be sitting at the office. Um, I've also recently heard a, a report about, you know, the need for, for like standing desks. I mean, we've, we've, we've seen that before in the past, but there's been some studies now where people, you know, in, in analyzing people working from home, you know, they're actually moving significantly less because the simple thing is about, you know, going to your car, driving into the office, and then maybe, you know, going out and walking around outside the office or going out to lunch. You know, you're actually moving a bit more than if you're truly just planted at your, your home office. So, you know, creating that that remote workspace that is going to, you know, provide for productivity and efficiency is something that I think a lot of organizations need to kind of go back and revisit just because the ones that have continued to have staff that is remote, um, you know, and a lot of times it was just a rush type of situation to get, you know, technology in place for them. And it might not be ideal. And, and those employees might not be the ones saying, hey, you know, this is not a perfect setup. So, you know, yeah, kind of going yeah. back and understanding the standards and what you need to have in place to give them all the tools that they need to continue to be productive is, is an important part of the process. Yeah, and I know, um, so you hit on a lot of kind of that physical environment and maybe even some hardware issues. Nick, what are you seeing from kind of like the accessibility side of things and, and making sure it's a good user experience and they're, they, they have the support they need even when they're remote? Well, that's, that's a huge shift because the last thing a company wants is for their employees to be not productive because something like their keyboard isn't working. Um, something that would take 30 seconds if somebody was there and they could put their hands on the computer and quickly root, you know, fix what's going on. Now it's a support call, you're wasting time. It's a troubleshoot dialogue, you're wasting more time to figure out that, hey, your keyboard's not working. Um, so now, the, the shift there is how do we give efficient support and break fix to our end users that we can't immediately put our hands on, on the devices. Um, a lot of that is having uh, backup devices. A lot of people are allowing bring your own device uh, policies in place just in case that their company issued uh, laptop isn't working. They got to have some kind of secondary to do. Um, and uh, a lot of uh, remote remote software in order to connect to the people's computer quickly and efficiently um, in order to help troubleshoot the situation in order to get their productivity back up. Um, so lots of, lots of shifts in that. It's a concern. Um, and always in play with that is security across the board. Um, you can't, like, the, 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 biggest, the biggest asterisk I'm going to put on this is the security aspect. Uh, so even with that, even with the help desk and even with the, especially the BYOD policies, security is a huge concern. You got to make sure that security is in the forefront before making any decision on how to adjust for your support and break fix. That makes sense. Um, I think we, we really killed the, the remote work topic. Uh, if you, I, and so I just want to make a, 
a quick, one more quick question, then we'll have a polling question for our audience. But okay, so outside of remote work, what are the less obvious kind of issues that businesses have run into over the last several months? And just um, maybe around Robin quick, what are your top one or two things that really kind of seem to be trending? Jeff, let's start with you and we'll, we'll go with Sarah then Nick. I'm sorry, can you say that one more time? Yeah, so outside of remote work, and maybe it's a result of remote work, um, what's kind of the top one or two um, less obvious um, transitions businesses had, has, have had to make and you're, you're seeing with your clients? Hmm. Um, that's a good question. The one that I the one that I see kind of coming up a little bit, and I don't know if that's just kind of unique in terms of the space that I um, represent with my clients is that um, I see more and more um, compliance related requirements on the client side. Um, you know, as, as security becomes more and more of an issue, um, I think that's kind of trickling down to a whole different level downstream, if you will, um, for that SMB space. Um, we've done a lot of um, compliance type of consulting engagements for customers. And, you know, typically when that started a couple, three years back, you know, it was more of that mid-tier in, in larger organizations. But I, I'm seeing that trend coming down to some of the smallest manufacturers that we're dealing with, where now for the first time, they're having to do some type of self-assessment to understand what their current state looks like. And, and what plans they have in place to, um, you know, address whatever vulnerabilities they might have in their environment. So that's that's definitely a, a, a major theme that I'm seeing um, across the board with my clients. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, not great, but it's definitely a concern and, and something that um, I've heard about addressing. Um, sorry, how about you? Yeah, so Kitty, I think I touched on one of them before, which is really, um, all of a sudden, when people aren't sitting at their desks, you you kind of relook at your processes that were working and not working. And like I mentioned, the whole uh, being able to walk up to someone's desk is just not available. So that's something that almost across the board, every client I talk to, we end up talking about some of the new things that we learned. But the other one's actually a more interesting, more global trend. Um, so if you guys think about it, pre-pandemic, um, our unemployment rate was insanely low. Um, just to give you guys an example, if we were looking for staff at SSR, um, our average hire time in the past was between four and five weeks. Uh, Pre-pandemic, we were, we were starting to hit um, you know, two months to three months to try and locate someone that we were looking for, uh, vet them out and bring them in. Um, and I would even venture to, to say, and, and it's probably uh, not a great thing to say, but when we brought them in, the ratio of the people that we were able to bring in that were successful um, probably in the last year pre-pandemic, um, not as many of them were successful right away as, uh, as what we used to have in the past. Um, but what, what it's done is now you've got people working remotely and a lot of business owners that I'm sitting down with, one of the conversations is, okay, uh, let's say in the future, I need a very specialized uh, skill that's much, much harder for us to get in a local area. Um, if, if we can figure out how to have people work remotely, uh, why can't I hire someone from Texas or someone from another location? So I think you're going to see some delocalization delocaliz of subject matter experts. Um, I think you're going to see really a unique way that the, the market is going to change. Uh, some of it's going to be good. Um, some of it I, actually keeps me awake a little bit, just as someone that's always uh, been a big believer in, in supporting the local economy. Um, but I think uh, for those companies that figure it out, Either how do you deliver that or or those people that actually look at it and say, how do I use it? It's actually going to give them scale um, um, as they grow their businesses. That makes a lot of sense. So kind of twofold, a trickle down effect almost of remote work is, you know, finding gaps in process and then, um, you know, kind of some opportunity and in, in kind of broadening the horizon of, of talent and how you work with each other. That's really interesting. How about you, Nick? Well, you said the top two. I'm going to have to put two more asterisks on security. Um, the with the remote, and they both have to do and directly responsible to the remote workforce. Uh, you have the remote connections coming in, so people are working from home, which means their ten dollar Belkin router that they got on Walmart during Black Friday isn't going to cut it. Um, they have to deal with everybody else that's on their network, their kids, and uh, whoever else is looking up whatever 
on the internet, if they're on the same network as that, then they're bringing risk and vulnerability to the entire company. Um, so that's, that is a not as obvious thing that uh, I've seen people um, have issues with. Uh, the other thing is I've seen more phishing attacks um, within this pandemic and very targeted and very aggressive uh, phishing attacks through email. Um, and if we think about it, why, one of the reasons why CEO fraud was so effective is because the CEO is generally not in the office. Um, you get an email from the CEO that demands you to do something now, and they're usually not there to val to validate it. You know, they're usually not answering their phone because they're out busy doing stuff. They're out busy growing the company, attending stuff, creating um, communications, creating relationships with other entities. You know, go out sailing their boat. You know, whatever they're doing. <laughs> and uh, yep, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and. Uh, that's why the C. That's one of the reasons why CEO fraud has actually worked for the hackers. So now you have people who are remote, and now that that scope broadens, where the attacker can really use any manager or anyone else in their department. Uh, whereas before, in the traditional setting, they go into the office and you get a weird email from somebody. Somebody can just lean back in their chair and be like, "Hey, hey, did you send me this email?" What, what? Why do you want me to go to the store and buy a bunch of iTunes gift cards? Like, you know, like what's going on with that? So you can't do that when you're remote, and especially if people aren't, you know, answering their phones or answering the team's message, trying to validate it. The scope broadens, um, so that uh, you know the hackers can try to exploit and use social engineering tactics that uh, aren't as traditional as just C CEO fraud. Um, so again, security is an asterisk with all of this. Okay, so we've got security double time. We've got um, <laughs> kind of a, a glo more global view and, and accessibility. We've got process and we've got compliance. So let's let's put this poll up there. Um, and the poll is what what's your top priority for the next twelve months? You should see it in the lower right of your screen. And um, you know, obviously, we listed a couple of things um, that we thought were going to were going to be or should be a priority. Let's let's see if they match yours. All right. Hopefully, you guys can see that now. And then, um, hey, Katie, I'd like to add yeah. one more thing. I think um, I I jumped ahead a little bit on the question that you had, but one other point I wanted to make is uh, with regard to this topic is is you know the ability to kind of flex. Um, within any kind of um, model that you guys currently have in place. I think one of the things that the industry has done even prior to the pandemic is that a lot of things have gone to a subscription-based licensing model. I think what, what you see with the Office 365 products is that, you know, it's all subscription-based. And the, the nice thing now about that is, is that that allows organizations to kind of scale up and scale back as needed. Um, and, you know, in, in the current state with the pandemic, I think that's more important than ever to be able to, because um, there might be a period of time where business is down and you need to cut back with staff. Uh, but at the same time, you know, when things come back, you're going to have to be able to scale back up. And having, um, you know, technologies in place that give you the ability to align the business that way is going to prove to be extremely productive. It also is just from an overall services standpoint. I mean, us as an organization, SSR, um, our whole model has always been that way where we provide, you know, just that right amount of service that our clients are looking for and, and have that ability to kind of flex up uh, and flex back as needed. And that's something that, you know, whether you do that with us or somebody else, I think it's extremely important that that organizations look at partners that, that have that ability to do that so that they're not locked in. Uh, because there's there's so much of the unknown in the foreseeable future. Yeah, if we learned anything this year, it's that you can, you have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Sorry. Um, you know, kind of taking a step back, we'll get, we'll give everybody. To, if you haven't answered the the polling question in the lower right of your screen, I'll give you just one more second while Sarah answers this question. I'm um, kind of taking a step back and looking at overall strategy. Um, we always kind of look at. At SSR, we look at increasing productivity, improving um, profitability, mitigating risk. Um, 
in the current conditions, meaning like pandemic, ever-changing unpredictability, as Jeff kind of mentioned, what are you looking for when you go in and assess an environment or assess a strategy or kind of help a, a client um, evaluate their, their IT strategy? What are those key points you're looking at? As to the, the key points I would look at it is first, is the, is the strategy really aligned to um, a change in business? Um, to give you an example, a lot of companies are using ERPs um, and they've been using it the same way for the last uh, 10 to 15 years. Um, and as the organization has changed and the unfortunate part of the pandemic, uh, I think you get, a lot of you guys know this, we, we support a lot of manufacturers in Southeast Wisconsin. Um, and I've, I've seen both sides of it. I've, I've got clients that have grown by uh, during this time period because they were very niche. Uh, but unfortunately, I've also seen a number of clients that, that uh, their revenues have been uh, uh, impacted. Um, and so making sure that when they're looking at technology, they're looking at saying, well, here's my business. It may actually have rapid growth. And if it does, how am I going to scale it from that standpoint? Um, I'm, I'm seeing people, we're talking about things like lead time. So when a client comes up with an opportunity, uh, how quickly can I get a quote out the door? How quickly can I get products and, and services out the door? Um, those become really, really important. The other thing I look at it is uh, probably something that I was talking about pre-pandemic, which is uh, really training. Um, uh, we, we're deploying a lot of technology and, and actually even what Nick talks about security. Um, and historically, a lot of it has been, let's implement something and people will figure it out, right? So it, you get the newest version of the software and we'll figure out how we're using it. Um, something I've been really looking at and observing is um, in many cases, people implement new technology, new software, new ways of doing something, but they really haven't spent the time to say, how do you actually make this thing usable? What's your standard? Why do you do it? How do you do it? I think that's an important part that everyone should be thinking about um, in, in order for us to scale. There's value in putting that together in a format that uh, that's reconsumable, because as you scale your organization, especially if we end up going to these distributed uh, subject matter experts, you'll wanna have training materials. So record that video on, here's how you use our, our, our ERP or our quoting tool and put that out there. Um, I think that having agility, uh, which means on a resource standpoint, um, be it companies like ourselves, which can flex up and down. Um, I've got clients that are looking at it saying, if there's things that are more commodity centric, um, are those are things that I actually wanna see if I can offload them. I wanna start looking at strategy now instead of just uh, doing design type of work. So what does that uh, virtual CIO do for me? Uh, how am I connecting with my customer? Um, that's probably one of the other big things that I would tell you is during this pandemic, we, we were all accustomed to driving up to meet uh, meet our customers, sit down with them, understand where they're, where they're at. Learning how to interact with them during this time period and in the future is going to become really key. That makes sense. Um, so kind of along the same lines, Nick. Oh, actually, let's let's share, let's close this poll here. We're, I'm just going to end the poll here. It looks like security is definitely by far the 100% winner. So that, that everybody's, I win? yeah, I everybody's thinking security. You win another question. That was doubling down on that. <laughs> All right. So since since we're security is the winner, Nick, you are the winner of the next question. Um, you did speak about security. What are some key checkpoints you look for when you're, you're assessing a security, the security of an environment? So checkpoints that I look for are what are your entry points into the company? Are they encrypted and tightened? Meaning there's level of encryption that is still insecure. You got to make sure that uh, any entry point is tightened to the latest standards, um, which requires uh, you know, scanning remediation, uh, getting an expert involved in order to know how to do that effectively without taking your company down. Um, also, are those points of entry necessary? Um, it, it's a shift of focus. Now let's say, uh, let's figure out how we can get less connection from the outside into our company as possible. And if it's absolutely necessary to have connections from outside in, are we doing it properly? Is there a DMZ in place? Uh, are the proper protocols in place? Are we following the compliance standards? Um, but if we can reduce the connections in, that would be the best way to go about it. If something is unnecessary, um, can we remove it? Also, you got your endpoints. 
uh, your all of your end users and, and their devices, do they have anti-malware on them? And not just that, can you verify and manage all of those devices in a single pane of glass? Everybody talks about Windows Defender and how Windows has its own built-in security. That's great. Um, but do you know what it takes in order to get that single pane of glass, in order to view everybody's computer and everybody's machine and be able to analyze the situation and the security standpoint? actually requires uh, quite a bit of licensing in order to do that. So um, traditional antiviruses are still being used. Uh, we need to make sure that there's no admin privileges to any endpoint uh, that is company issued um, at all which means it kind of makes the BYOD device policy kind of get thrown out the window because everybody is an admin to their own personal device. Um, that adds a security risk. Uh, also, you need to review your security permissions. If those, if, if those accesses are necessary, review the security permissions. Make sure that the people can only get to absolutely what they need to get to. Reduce their access everywhere else. It's better for people to call up and say, hey, I need access to this. Then that sparks a conversation. Well, do you really need access to that? Who are you? Um, things like that. I think so from like the one other thing I would add into yours is uh, we talked about this a lot, which is really end user training. Um, I think the whole phishing training, I mean, we, uh, that becomes even more important because a lot of what you've talked about was the active side of security, um, but still, isn't it like somewhere about 85 to 90 percent of all threats happen from what the end user does? And then, of course, if they have admin rights, then it gets worse from there. So you can have you can have as much security infrastructure humanly possible in a company. Your worst your big your your worst bottleneck for security is going to be end user knowledge. So if the end user does something that's insecure, then all of the security in the world um, can't really mitigate that. So training is actually the most efficient way. Training your end users in order to, hey, here's some very simple practicals to do this, don't do this. You don't have to be a security expert to understand it, but here's here's a lot of security practicals that you know you, you should you should work on focusing on. Like hovering over a link in your email. Is that link really where it's supposed to go to? Review the um, mail to reply or the, the reply email address. Uh, in an email that gets skipped. If people aren't, aren't trained to do that, it gets easily skipped and they just read the name of the person who sent the email rather than the reply address. Um, so very, the, the training is absolutely, I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up, Sarah, because training can be the, the quickest and most effective way in order to make a company be vulnerable to being very tightened with their security. Actually, that's a good point. I think everybody, you know, you you look at just maybe a decade or maybe a little longer ago, not everybody in the company is using technology. And now we're looking at every single department, every single person in the company is using, is accessing organizational data and using technology. And I think one of the other things that we kind of talk through and, and we're talking about, you know, how does it play into strategy is the idea of, um, IT being a larger um, player within each department. Um, from a marketing perspective, obviously we're using a ton of technology all the time and need IT support from that regard. What are you guys seeing businesses do to help um, kind of make sure each area in the business is represented in the IT strategy as well as supported? And I guess I, I'm throwing it out there to anybody who wants to pick it up first, but I think you all have a, a really good view on, on how that's playing out. So I can start with that. Um, so focusing the technology on being the seamless experience rather than having to piggyback on several different technologies in order to get to where you want to be. For example, the reason why I bring that up is because um, a lot of when the pan, when the pandemic uh, hit, like initially hit back in March and uh, people started doing remote work and uh, let's say the company never had thought about remote work before. Well, all of their internal uh, infrastructure and all of the, the way that people get work done has to be from internal because that's 
the product that they bought. That's the process that they've already established. So now, instead of accessing something like a web app, where a web app is easily accessible with any browser, you can secure it, um, you can even um, hire a service, like have a, a um, infrastructure as a service in order to take care of the security for you and um, host up the, the necessary resources for you. They're trying to, say, connect a VPN, then connect to a computer, then run an application that connects to a server. So it's, it gets very inefficient that way if the focus isn't to, uh, you know, prioritize the seamless connection and capabilities. Also, um, is it necessary to access drives on a server in order to get files? We have plenty of ways of technology in order to have that not be necessary anymore. We got Azure file storage, we have SharePoint, we have Teams, there's a file section in Teams. Um, the, the fo it's a focus shift, again, it's, a, it's how can we get to the resources without actually having to jump through hoops to get inside the infrastructure. Um, and again, the catch with all of that is security, permission, going <laughs> properly, um, tightening up the, the access, so as always, Nick is very, very, very focused on the end user experience, which I truly appreciate. Um, Jeff, I know you've worked with uh, clients on kind of a more higher level approach and, and how they make sure that IT is understanding that end user need and really the needs of that department. Can you speak a little bit to that? Um, yeah, I think that's, um, you know, certainly during the pandemic, that's another one of the challenges in that um, you know, with, with some of the clients that we have, uh, that we work with that have IT staff in-house, um, you know, if, if those folks now have, have moved to kind of very remote type setup, um, how, do they, how do they align now to continue to support uh, the remote workers? I mean, traditionally what, what they've been used to is that if there's issues that come up within the organization, you've got somebody that comes down the hall, knocks on their door, says, I need help. Well, now that's no longer an issue. So what, what tools are in place for existing IT staff in-house that allows them to continue to have that flexibility to, con to, to continue supporting, um, you know, the staff that they need to? And, you know, do you have to have a partner that you work with that can, you know, support that since, you know, there's new challenges that that presents? Um, the other, just kind of harping again on, on what, what Nick's point is with security, I mean, the big thing with training and using, you know, diff the different tools that are out there to provide security training, um, you know, it's important to consider those because the, the, the hardest thing to do is to have that training come from, you know, a particular person within the organization. A lot of times, you know, if it's something IT related, you know, that task gets put on an IT manager or somebody in-house that to, to keep that up. Very difficult to do um, in that, you know, you've got a changing workforce all the time. You've got people coming, you've got new people coming into the organization that need to understand that process. And then there's the, the whole offboarding piece of that. But but making sure that, that there are tools in place that can be effectively used um, so that when new folks do come in the organization that that message is consistent with regards to training um, is gonna be hugely important. Okay. Um yeah, I think, I think security and training have definitely been a trending topic on this call as well as many, many other um, conversations. Um, that makes a lot of sense. And I kind of want to play back into, um, sorry, earlier in the conversation, you brought up aligning your IT strategy to your business strategy. And kind of yeah. thinking through that, how do you see IT coming alongside leadership and really mirroring those two perspectives? Yeah, so actually I was gonna answer the question you'd asked earlier, but uh, this question actually goes hand in hand with that. Um, a lot of organizations, they kind of leave it to, if they have a, a CIO or IT manager, it's your job to go figure it out or they assign it to the CFO. Again, I've always looked at businesses in these three legs, right? There's sales and marketing, operations, and then finance and, and controls. Um, if you're not doing this, one of the things I'd recommend almost every business is create an IT steering committee. Right, so um, individuals from each of those groups and then start looking at it saying, what type of uh, access to data, what data do I need to do my job better? Um, what type of integration, what's data that I'm re-entering over and over again? Um, what data do I need to visualize 
to say how are things working from that standpoint. You use those kind of three things in that steering committee to say what's working and what's not and how do I align it. One of the component I would really ask you, everyone to look at is look both internally and externally, right? IT is supposed to give you the ability to accelerate your relationship outside the organization. What data are you providing your customers so they can have better uh, decision making from things that you're sending them um, as well as internally. So if I summarize it, I would tell you, if you haven't done it, everyone, start creating a, an IT steering committee. Um, lead it with those three groups of, of people. And again, with operations, you might have uh, five subunits in it. And in sales and marketing, you may have business development and sales, but figure out those lead teams and bring them together and then start looking at it saying, um, what's the data you're looking for? What's the, um, what type of access do you need? Uh, how do we integrate it so we reduce inefficiencies? Um, and then when it's all put together, figure out your training plan. Oh yeah, of course, if I don't say this, secure your plan. <laughs> or you tell me about it. I was waiting for it, I was waiting for it. All right, okay, I'm gonna launch another poll and we wanna know what about your current the current situation, meaning the pandemic, um, will make your company better in the long run. So looking looking for that opportunity in terms of IT strategy. Um, in the lower right, you should see that question pop up and we'd love to hear what you're thinking. Um, while you do that, also, um, if you have any questions that are kind of popping in your head right now, be sure to chat them. We're happy to answer those on the fly. Um, and we're kind of moving into the tail end of our, um, our discussion here, guys. So to kind of bring it all together, um, let's ask kind of that elephant in the room and kind of that talks to that um, polling question we have up there right now. Um, what are the big long-term shifts you guys are, are foreseeing right now? Um, Jeff, why don't we start with you? Um, I, I think Sart kind of touched on that um, with IT steering committees. I think I do see that as being um, an important shift that needs to take place with some of our smaller clients where, where the business is really aligning more to um, where, where technology and the business are com coming together more. Um, I do see a lot of times where there are projects and initiatives that end up on the shoulders of IT that really shouldn't be IT um, initiatives per se without the business involvement. Um, I mean, I think traditionally because there's some form of technology involved in, in something that, that, that somebody's looking to implement, that somehow that just gets departmentalized and put in a bucket where you know IT is supposed to come up with the answer. But I think as time goes on, um, organizations are gonna have to figure out ways how to connect um, IT with business leaders a little bit more consistently. Um, and so from an overall vision standpoint that, that that leadership vision is understood so that that can kind of trickle down and um, in terms of, of the technology that's gonna be put in place to support that, that, it, that it's much more in line with what, what it needs to be. So having those, those organizations kind of come together more um, and not be as siloed as, as they have been in the past. Um, I think, um, you know, organizations that certainly have some kind of IT in-house, you know, look to elevate those those folks uh, and look look to have them kind of sit at the same side of the table as, as the business does when it comes to strategy type discussions um, so, so that the alignment is, is more clear. I think that'll be a very important thing moving forward. Awesome, how about you, Nick? I think this is going to be a catalyst for cloud solutions. Okay. Uh, and the reason why I say that is because um, not everybody is a, a quick adopter and quick believer in cloud solutions, including myself. You know, the, the, us admins, I'm the typical admin that I want to have control over my stuff. I want my stuff. If it's in the cloud, I don't have control over my stuff, and I can't do as much with my stuff. But um, with this, uh, with the remote solutions, it makes a lot more sense. Uh, so I see this as a catalyst for businesses that were originally closed off to the idea of having cl cloud solutions, uh, looking more towards that in order to have uh, seamless um, interaction with uh, end units, remote end units, and to uh, um, make things more convenient. 
Uh, also, security programs uh, <laughs> along with that. I see that as becoming a much more popular thing. Whereas, like five years ago, I see that being as like an underground sort of movement happening as far as having phishing campaigns and uh, uh, having uh, an IT department be like, uh, you know, having a charge towards security and creating that communication with the end users. Now it's more of a necessity. It's not an underground good idea. It's like this. You need to have security training. You need to have a security program in order to effectively pull this off. Um, the large businesses have already been doing this for a while, but now the small to medium businesses are looking at this and saying, okay, I'm going to shift my focus. This needs to be a focus. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, sorry, your turn. Um, so I, I would kind of summarize it in probably two or three things. One is the ability to pivot. Um, if you guys look at it, the restaurant industry just got killed over the, this pandemic. And those restaurants that quickly pivoted and really changed it to say, here's our unique menus, here's the way we put it together. And even as things come together, um, when, when Lisa and I, like my wife and I, when we go out, there's restaurants that really have figured it out. They make you feel safe. They put, they've got great programs out there. They, they've figured out how to make their sidewalks uh, outdoor restaurant space. They pivoted. Um, so we're attending those, right? Um, I think that also translates to other businesses. How are you pivoting and how are you pivoting quickly? Um, your ability to scale both up and down. Um, I actually do think that there's going to be uh, big changes that comes out of this from uh, supply chain. Who are, who are we buying stuff from? Where are we getting things from? Um, and, and your customers, if they're not asking it, will eventually start asking those type of questions. So, so your ability to answer that and be able to say, how am I addressing it and how am I scaling up different parts of the business uh, becomes important. And the third one would be is, is, is your resources. Um, I think that this is going to create a unique uh, environment at the gig economy. I truly believe uh, a year or two years from now, you're going to have uh, people that are not really employees of a company, but they're standalone people that uh, are really talented in one or two areas. And they really want to help companies or multiple companies from remote locations. So not just a consulting firm, but really you're looking for a, a very specialized engineer. They happen to live in California and they're serving three clients as, as if they're employees from that standpoint. So I think those are going to be three big things that come out of this. That's awesome. Um, so I think those are all amazing, um, really for, foresight into kind of how this is going to play out. Um, you know, looking at the polling coming in, um, better resiliency is, and agility and technology investments um, you know, kind of echo what you guys are commenting on. Um, yeah. We have about three minutes left. Um, there's one question that I have to throw out to you guys. And if anybody else has any others, um, please throw them in the chat box. So um, this one, I think probably it's maybe driven by all the security talk and, and possibly compliance a little bit, but what are kind of those policies and expectations that um, should be in place right now? And uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe um, sorry, you can start and then Jeff and Nick, you add on. You know, actually, I, I like that question because oftentimes, guys, we look at compliance uh, and, you know, a lot of companies will say, well, I don't really have a compliance need. My type of company doesn't really require to be um, ITAR compliant or something else. Um, when we use the word compliance, we're really looking at it saying, what's the standards that you're putting in place uh, for good, you know, hygiene based computing? Um, so a lot of things that we, we really want to talk through is, um, and these really haven't changed since the world of IT, it's just what's happened is data has become available everywhere, right? When I started my career in IT, if you went to buy software, you went to the IT department, they researched it, they implemented it, you had one device that you used at work, maybe we introduced eventually a phone. Well, today, your data is everywhere, right? It, it's commingled in your, in your personal device at home, uh, you've got it sitting on a cloud that's shared through, um, you know, Dropbox on 20 of your, of your different computers and devices, even computers that no longer you're using. The moment you boot them up, they're already authenticated and you can start downloading all those files there. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited about what the cloud is going to do, but I do think that this concept of, of compliance, we're going to have to start thinking about this and saying, What's the data, who gets access to it, and where should they get access to it? I think that that will be a driver of this. That's what's gonna drive this concept of compliance. I think um, 
there, there's this uh, a, a bit of work that we do that's known as the 800-171, and it was specifically made by the Department of Defense for for manufacturers. Uh, well, it's really um, it's really put together uh, as a framework on on doing good IT computing and and security. Um, you don't you can use that framework and implement it, and it helps your organization even if you're not really required to do that. So I think um, that becomes important to me. I think it's really good to just, you know, get a baseline of that too. I mean, for, for all organizations, whether there is some direct compliance requirement that, that uh, is being put upon the business or not, um, you know, getting, getting that current baseline, you know, current state and understanding where you are. And, you know, with a lot of these requirements, it's, it's also one of those things where you just need to show an effort that you understand your current state and that you're driving to some kind of end goal. And, you know, having just kind of that basic plan in place, knowing where your current state is and, and having some defined goals in terms of things that you might remediate, whether it's something that needs to be done, you know, right away or something, you know, more of a, a future state type type thing is just really important. And I think, like Sarah said, um, you know, having having that in place, whether it's truly a compliance requirement or not, is still going to put you in a better spot and, and having that based off you know, some kind of best practice analysis as well. Yeah. Um, that makes sense. Thank you. Nick, you're good? Okay. Yeah, they're talking <laughs> about security, so I'm good. I'm <laughs> well, we, we, <laughs> we are running a, a one minute over, so I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, uh, Sarit, Jeff, um, Nick, thank you for all the great insight you guys provided today, and, and thank you all for joining us. Um, please take a minute um, to provide some feedback. I'm going to pop up a, um, a feedback survey. Um, if you just click on the link and it'll take you directly to the survey and that'll help us um, improve for future sessions. Um, maybe even give us a couple of topic ideas. Um, speaking of future sessions, Tech Bytes, our next Tech Bytes session is on September 22nd. We'll be talking about Lake Country Manufacturing's data journey. Don Sura from Lake Country will be joining us and we're lo looking forward to a really engaging and insightful conversation with him. Um, we're also putting together several resources and um, webinars to celebrate National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. And Nick, you should just be jumping out of your seat right now, um, which is the month of October. So coming up quickly. If you haven't already, follow us on LinkedIn and subscribe to our newsletters and updates so you don't miss any of those sessions. And again, thank you for your time today. We're looking forward to your feedback and seeing you on future Tech Bite sessions. Thanks, guys. Thanks, gang. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone.